Luke chapter 6, 43 to 45. This is what it says. No good tree bears bad fruit. That makes sense. Nor does a bad fruit bear good fruit. Oh, a bad tree bear bad... Sorry. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Our title, Evident Change. Some of you online joining us on Facebook or YouTube, you know the title already. Evident Change, talking about the power of a transformed life. It's a simple study and a simple challenge for all of us. The Apostle Paul, before he was Paul, everyone knew or everyone knows that he was called Saul. Remember Saul of Tarsus? He was a champion of the Jewish religion, what we call Judaism. He was a feared prosecu a persecutor of the early church, the New Testament church. He was an enemy at that time. He was a leader of that sect called the Pharisees. In fact, the story is in Acts chapter 9. If you want to be studying that, if you want to have a, some kind of a homework, look at Acts chapter 9. Jesus himself appears to Paul, to Saul at that time, and spoke to him. Remember the road to Damascus? Why was he going to Damascus? He heard that there were Christians gathered there people of the way, and he wanted to go there and personally lead the persecution. On that road, there was a miraculous encounter. Blindness happened in a few days, and there were some years of growth and transformation. Later on, in short, that story, Saul becomes Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, writing over one-third of the New Testament for us, and planting many churches, raising up many pastors. Truly, the apostle to the Gentiles. At first, it was an instant. Many, and you will read it again in chapter 9, there were many who doubted him and doubted his motives, doubted this whole story of conversion. They didn't believe him. What? So? Oh, he's probably a spy. He's just pretending to be a Christian so he gets to know our ways and where we worship, what we do, and then he's going to have us killed. Going to persecute us. Read chapter 9 of Acts. And you will see that what convinced them, it was actually his transformed life, his repentance, and the change that convinced them. Read it. It was the fruits of repentance and the, and the evidence of change that showed and displayed his genuine faith. So, let me give you an example of this. What best describes you? Changed, period. Changed or changed? It's a big difference what a simple punctual mark can make given the right context. Some of us are changed. No drama, no moving experience, just transformed or being transformed by the Holy Spirit and growing more and more into Christ likeness. Period. Some of us are changed with an exclamation point. Talking about a total 180 degree turn from what they were to what they were before and what they are now in Christ. They're very dramatic. Usually they're into some kind of vice, some kind of very bad lifestyle. Then because of Christ, dramatic, inspiring, 
revolutionary changes, exclamation point. Some of us are changed with a question mark. So far, only service. So far, only confession. No real drama because there's no real transformation happening. Now, if this person, if he said he was a Christian, everyone around him has a big question mark in their face. Christian? Changed? Ask yourself, which type of Christian are you? Changed? Changed? Or changed? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a verse we usually talk about in terms of the change and the transformation that should be happening in the life of a Christ follower, a true Christ follower. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, after talking about what it means to be in Christ, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new person. The old has gone. Behold, see, the new has come. He's saying, behold, you will observe change. Paul was actually saying that in Christ, I will never be the same. Nice. <clears throat> Jesus said, and we read that, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, in his book, Pat Morley, Patrick Morley, his book was entitled, I Surrender. He writes that the church today has an integrity problem. And that integrity problem is because of a misconception. A misconception, a thinking that you can add Christ to your life, but not subtract sin. Talking about change, if Christ in your life, you'll have to subtract sin. He says it is actually a, uh, this misconception of, of Christianity being a change in belief without a change in behavior. He goes on to say it is actually revival without reformation or revival without repentance. He goes on to say you cannot add Christ and stay the way you are. All of these people, all of these verses seem to say and point to one truth. If you are a Christian, if you've confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, there will be fruit, there will be change. What's the expectation? Let me put it plainly. It tells you, bear fruit. Jesus was saying, every tree is known by its fruit, and every tree that does not bear fruit will be cut down at all. Bear fruit, because these fruits display the change that is happening inside of you. Mm. You're talking about visible changes, and, and I want to emphasize that. The visible changes that goes on in your life as a result of Christ in you. If you are genuinely a Christian, you will move from what you were to what you are becoming. That's coming from inside going out. From being self-centered and selfish to being other-centered or Christ-centered. From being the one asking to be served to the one wanting to serve. From the one looking out for number one to those that are looking out for others. For being, from being someone who's centered on pleasing man and his traditions and customs to someone who's wanting to please God. Minus the sin, more on the holiness, Talking about the Lordship of Christ in every area of his life. Someone who says, I am not my own anymore. My values, my morality 
It's not something I created. It's not the culture that gives that to me. I'm in Christ. And I get it from Christ and His Word. From having bad habits to developing and nurturing good ones. Doing everything to get rid of vices. Of having my recreation time something that is God-centered and Christ-centered. Having, surrounding myself with peers and company that are a good influence in terms of my character and staying away from those that influence me negatively. Having a change in terms of our, my priorities. Before, my Sunday morning was like this. It's called a hangover. But now, uh, my Sunday morning is called a worship service. There's an actual change. Not just in terms of what I said, but in terms of my schedule, my priorities. And you will see even in your habits, in your relationships, in your words, in terms of your clothes, to your fashion, to the choice of music, to the kind of art, to the books that you read, the websites you visit, the magazines, it all forms of social media. There's a change. It's not just something that someone said, oh, I like that. Christ? Oh, I like that. It's not just a comment that says, I believe in that but a lifestyle that is changed, changed, or changing for the glory of God. Amen? These are the visible, uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing on the visible changes in your life that are evidence of Christ's presence in you. That's the old excuse. Oh, Pastor, isn't it in the Bible in Samuel, where God, uh, he, he, Samuel says, God looks at the heart, but man looks out the outside. So why are you telling us to focus on the outside? No, no, no. I'm saying true transformation means that change that happens inside will evidently bear fruit on the outside. Don't use that as, as an excuse. You know what I mean. And you know you're just making an excuse when you say that. Yes, God looks at your heart. But what happens in your heart is that there is a seed that is planted. It's called the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's salvation that is planted in your heart, slowly growing out into your values, your behavior, your thinking, your mindset, later on into your words, your thoughts, your deeds, your relationships, your work ethic, etc., you are a new creation. The old life has gone, the new has come. Put off, um, Paul was saying. Put off the old self. In fact, he uses the word mortify. Die to your old self. It's dead in Christ. It's been crucified with Christ. Paul was saying, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I'm born again. And this new life, I live for his glory. You put on the new self. Now ask yourself this. Pastor, if there is no evidence, no fruit, no sign, no proof of God's life in you, then maybe there isn't. Right? I mean, if, there's, if, if you're looking at dirt, after a month, after two months, after three months, and nothing is sprouting up. After a year, after three years, nothing is sprouting up. What are you looking at? You're looking at dirt. You're not looking at seed. You're looking at dirt. If the seed of the Word of God is planted in your heart, and the life of Christ is growing in you, yes, it's not instantaneous for some, but definitely, absolutely, in time, it will bear fruit. It will grow roots. It will sprout up. It will go up and bear fruit a hundredfold because God's life is in you. Change. So look at the person to your left or to your right or beside you online. Tell them, change. That's the power of a transformed life. This is not a true story. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, not a true story. 
There was a cannibal. You know what a cannibal is, right? This cannibal was converted. He was sitting by the fire cooking, reading his Bible, because he's a Christian already. When a scientist, an anthropologist, passes by and sees him, his friend, you know, the anthropologist scientist says to the cannibal, the converted cannibal, you know, modern man has rejected that book you're reading. It is a pack of lies. It's fiction. Don't waste your time reading it. The cannibal with a smirk looks him over from head to toe and says, you know, if it wasn't for this book, you won't be invited to dinner. You will be dinner. <laughs> That's why Patrick Morley was saying, you cannot be in Christ and stay the way you are. I'm not saying right now today, but something has to happen and you're growing every day. I'm challenging you towards knowing this. Look at yourself a year uh, from last year, from two years ago, from five years ago. Is there visible, evident change that shows that the miraculous life of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, has been planted in your heart? And there's a change. Somehow. If there's nothing evident on the outside, I know, you should know, that there's something going on even just on the inside. Some people grow fast, some people grow slowly, but there is change. Evident change. How many of you have experienced or seen a miracle? Like, you know, a miraculous healing, a miraculous provision, miraculous protection. I've, I've witnessed a few. <clears throat> there have been great miracles of healing or inspiring miracles of, of provisions before. And they have all served to attract people to Jesus and his kingdom. But, until today, still, one of the greatest miracles, if not the greatest miracle of Jesus, is the ones that really expand his kingdom and spread his gospel. What's that? It's the miracle of a changed life. The miracle of a changed life. Amazing grace, the writer says. How sweet the sound. Save the wretch like me. I once was lost. Now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Paul says, I'm dead, but now I'm alive in Christ. I used to be going that way. Now I'm going that way. A different set of direction, values, priorities. Evident change. The miracle of a changed life. Now, let me share with you two things important to remember. I'll give it to you already so that you're not confused where we're going with this. Don't just say it. You need to display it. And keep it real. Don't be a hypocrite. What do I mean? This is disturbing for some of us this is disturbing verse. There's some verses that when you read it and you don't study it too much, uh, you'll be disturbed. Look at this. Jesus says this several times in the Gospels. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh-oh. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Have you come across this verse before? an important verse to remember. There's a pastor that simply says, all you have to do is believe and confess. Have you heard people say this? All you need to do is believe and confess and you'll be saved. Well, this is not what this verse is saying. Either that pastor was shortchanging Jesus or he's outright lying or Jesus was not telling the truth. I'd go with Jesus. I'd go with Jesus. Because he's saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone that calls out to me and confesses that they're a Christian, not everyone that professes me as their Lord is really entering the kingdom. But he who does, not he who says, but he who does, not he who confesses, 
lives and professes that with his life. He who does the will of my Father. You need to distinguish between what you're saying and confessing and professing with what you're living and what you're practicing. Mm. You can't just be saying it. You need to be living it, demonstrating it. Not all. There will be some who will say, Lord, Lord, but I don't really know them. There, there will be some that look like it, but they're not really. A bad parent will say, son or daughter, do as I say, not as I do. That's bad parenting, right? <laughs> Have you said that, parents? Do as I say, because I said so. Just don't do what I do. That's bad parenting. That lessens the credibility of who you are as a parent and your credibility in giving instruction. That lessens the credibility of anyone who says, I am a Christ follower, yet lives, or the evidence is not there, that they are truly transformed. Listen to Matthew Henry. I'll just quote it because it's easier. You cannot always distinguish a tree by their bark and leaves, he says. But by their fruit, you shall know them. The fruit is always according to the tree. That makes sense. That's why he's a Bible commentator. How about John MacArthur? Pastor, writer. Kind of popular the past few months, past few years. This is what he says. False prophets can disguise and hide their bad fruit for a while with ecclesiastical trappings, biblical knowledge, evangelical vocabulary. They can cover it up by belonging to Christian organizations, associating with Christian leaders, and talking about divine things. These are false prophets. But how they talk, how they act, and how they react, when not in the view of Christians, will eventually expose their true loyalty and convictions. What is in the heart, will emerge, and corrupt theology will result in corrupt life. False teaching and perverted living are inseparable and eventually will become manifest. You're worried about false teachers. Don't worry. By their fruit, you will know them. Many of us did not go through a dramatic transformation, a dramatic conversion like Paul or like some people that you know that they're drug addicts and drunk cards and then the next day after meeting Christ right there and then dramatic change not all of us maybe some of us went through something like that but all of us that transformation that happened if you are a Christian is nothing short of miraculous, amen you're a miracle I'm a miracle. Now, tell that to the person to your left or right so that they're encouraged. Tell them, you know, you're a miracle. What happened in you, even if it's not fully evident yet, the power of a transformed life starts with the seed salvation in you. They might not look like they're very different, but there should be some evidence later on. Not as dramatic, but still as miraculous. What's important? The change. And the change in lifestyle. And it's a process. Remember Jesus, when he confronted that, that woman, he, they would set a trap uh, for a woman that was caught in adultery, John chapter 8. Remember that? John chapter 8, there's a woman caught in adultery was brought before Jesus as a trap for Jesus. And then Jesus saw that woman caught in adultery, no doubt. But what did Jesus do? Jesus offered forgiveness and salvation. But not only that, Jesus challenged her towards changed life. Look at what it says. John chapter 8, verses 10 to 11. If you're taking down notes, John chapter 8, 10 to 11. Jesus straightened up and asked her. It was just her and the woman. After the, whoever has no sin... Let him cast the first stone. Remember that? Then everyone left. Jesus and the woman, the adulterous woman. Jesus straightened up and asked her, 
are they? Has no one condemned you? She looks around. No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus saves her, forgives her, gives her another chance. Another chance for what? Then Jesus declared. Look at the last part. Go now and leave your life of sin. I forgive you and I'm giving you a chance to live your life changed. Bear fruit of this repentance that you are now given. Bear fruit of this salvation that you are now given. Go live your life of sin. That's why, don't just say it. You need to live it, display it. Also, you need to keep it real. That's why the whole message of Jesus, he was always against hypocrisy. He didn't like people saying one thing and being another. That's why he said, every good tree will bear good fruit. That's just simple logic. And a bad tree will bear bad fruit. How do you know it's a bad tree? It's bad fruit. How do you know it's a good tree? It's good fruit. Not just in terms of the leaves, not just in terms of the foliage, not just in terms of the bark, but in terms of the fruit. Now, a good tree, conversely, the same logic, the good tree will not bear, cannot bear bad fruit, and the bad tree will not and cannot bear good fruit. goes on with a simple analogy. Do you pick grapes from thorn bush, or do you pick figs from briars or thistles? No, of course not. That's the simple answer to that. The tree that has no or bad fruit is cut down and thrown. It's just going to take up nutrients and space that otherwise good trees can benefit from. Now, wh why did Jesus say all these things? He was not just warning the church and people about false teachers. Of course, Matthew, Matthew in the, Matthew chapter 7, he was warning them. But not only that, he was telling them about their lifestyle. Be warned against false teachers, but also watch yourself. Don't become a false follower. Don't be one of those that just say it, but don't live it. Don't be a hypocrite. They are one thing on a Sunday, but another thing on a Monday. Mm -hmm. They are followers in church but freelancers outside. Their lives, there's a backstage and an onstage. There's no integrity in terms of who they are. Their words betray them. Their choices in lifestyle. Their choices in terms of recreation. Their choices in terms of uh, work or work ethic betray them. That's called a hypocrite. Now in Texas, there were two men who robbed the bank. One of them wore a ski mask and the other did not. They both were captured and ultimately appeared before the judge before sentencing. The one without the mask said this, Look, your honor, I know that robbing the bank was wrong. It was the wrong thing to do. But at least, listen to what he's saying, but at least I was not critical about it. I did not try to cover up who I was. I was real. I was open and honest. That should be worth something, right? The judge sentenced both men to the same prison sentence. Confession is one thing. Repentance is the real issue. What we are after is a lifestyle, not lip service. It doesn't really matter in the long run, in the actual accounting. It doesn't really matter if you confess you're a Christian. It doesn't really matter if you say, I'm born again. It doesn't really matter how many verses you are spewing out unless, unless it is backed up by a lifestyle and not just lip service. I'm saying it lightly, but you know, this is heavy stuff. An evident change in your life 
is the power of the gospel of Jesus. A healthy tree or a healthy fruit tree doesn't really need to try to bear fruit, right? It simply will. If you are, if but some of you are getting anxious already. So, Pastor, how do I know? How do, how, do, how do I know? I know I'm born again, so don't worry. Don't be anxious. If what is planted in you is the real life of Jesus, it will start to. If you do your, your best to try to nurture it with God's word and good company. If you're nurturing it in meditation on, on God's presence. And evidently it will change you from within. It will come out in real fruit. <clears throat> the righteousness is skin deep, purely ceremonial, or just for show. Hey, have you been to a, a phone store? Like, uh, I, I'm with T-Mobile, so you go to T-Mobile. They, they have a lot of phones. In the, and there are some phones that are, wow, nice, this is good. You get it. It says there in the sticker, for display only. Because, you know, it looks good. It looks like the real thing, but it's, it's just plastic. It's not really, it's, it's a model. Even if you wanted to steal it, it's nothing. Right? That, probably not why no one's stealing it. <laughs> it's for display only. We cannot afford to have Christ followers that are for display only. They look, sound, feel like the real thing, but really there's no change. Happening. There's no power of a transformed life there. <clears throat> Some people come to Christianity because they have a leaky faucet. I just read this and I'll read it to you. They come to Christianity because they have a leaky faucet that they want God to fix. Maybe the struggle with a destructive habit or a series, a series of bad circumstances or they would like just to tap into God's power to help them break free of some bad stuff a broken relationship that they want God to mend, or, or just emotionally low. But we learn from Jesus that he is not a plumber. Leaky faucets are not his thing. God wants to, he, to tear the plumbing out and completely deal with the well from which the water flows. He wants to change what comes out of the faucet, not merely stop its leak nor polish the metal. Does that make sense? A fruit tree may be beautiful, decorative, and offer plenty of shade. I think I wrote this down here. No, I did not. <clears throat> A fruit tree may be beautiful, decorative, and offer plenty of shade in the summer, but its primary purpose is to bear fruit. It is therefore judged by what it produces and not by how it looks. A person's faith and character his inner motives, standards, loyalties, attitudes, and ambitions, no matter what he professes, will eventually show through what he does and how he acts, his choices, and his lifestyle. Amen? One Sunday, after a very inspiring church service, a young woman came up to the preacher and said, Oh, pastor, she had tears in her eyes. Oh, I was thinking to myself, that was a wonderful sermon. And how wonderful it would be if the promises of God that you talked about, I, it'll be wonderful if, if it were all true. Uh-oh. <laughs> if it were true, what is it then? Is it fiction? Is it wishful thinking? Or is it reality? <clears throat> That's why I say, the problem today is not that the world does not believe. It's not the unbelief of the world, but the half-baked belief of the church. The problem today, you go out there and people don't believe the gospel. Of course, they, they're in the world. They're blind to that. The bigger problem is the half-baked faith of the church. No wonder they don't believe. Christians themselves are not sure if they do. No wonder our witness is weak. Christ's followers are all words lacking in action. No wonder they are not convinced. There are many who profess and confess, but few that bear fruit, the fruit of real change and transformation. Amen? 
by their fruit, you will recognize them. A good tree will bear good fruit. Fruit that displays the miraculous work of God from within. Brothers and sisters, wake up call again. What's love got to do with it? If God loves you and has changed you, it will become evident, especially to those who are around you. Amen? Evident change, the power of a transformed life. Let's stand up. Let's pray.